as much of an advisor to Neil uh, as I have been, uh, especially since I spend a lot of time over in uh, ECE uh, doing uh, other things. So anyway, Neil, uh, please tell us about uh, your, your work. All right. uh, thank you for the introduction, Professor Mandir. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for attending my dissertation defense. Uh, before I begin with my presentation, I'd like to first express my sincere gratitude to the committee members for being here and for taking time out to improve the quality of my research. Uh, throughout my grad school journey, you've been advocates of my success, and you've been a tremendous source of inspiration for me, and I'm highly grateful for that. The title of my dissertation is a mouthful, to say the least. What I tried to do over the past four years was to push the envelope in terms of the performance of next generation Wi-Fi networks by employing the architecture of distributed multi-user MIMO. Now, there are three main components to my research. I'll address them individually as we proceed further with the talk. I'd like to begin my presentation with a synopsis of my research. We envision next generation Wi-Fi networks to be able to support extreme indoor throughput that is facilitated by dynamic configuration of cells while still adhering to the current doctrine of standard framework. We call these throughput requirements to be extreme because that is how IEEE addresses them. Now, to realize this vision, there are three key disruptive technologies at play. First is the use of distributed multi-user MIMO to enhance network capacity. Second is leveraging principles from deep reinforcement learning to further optimize network configurations. And finally, the availability of millimeter wave frequency bands that can provide large channel bandwidths. In this slide, I'll provide the motivation behind my research. Emerging data intensive applications like augmented reality and virtual reality will drive the throughput requirements of next generation wireless networks. To meet such burgeoning data demands, there are typically two approaches that are adopted. First is the use of wireless channels with large bandwidths. Over the course of several years, Wi-Fi has steadily added support to wider channels, starting from 20 MHz in 1999, going up to 160 MHz in 2013, and 320 MHz now under consideration. Large bandwidths correspond to large data capacities of the wireless channel. Another approach is to densify the network, that is to increase the density of deployment of Wi-Fi access points. With the increased number of access points, the presence of coverage holes in the network will be curtailed, Furthermore, users will enjoy a higher average signal to noise ratio because they can find access points close to them. This will lead to higher throughput being delivered to the users. These two approaches, however, are at odds with each other. A ramification of densifying the networks is that co-channel access points or access points in the same channel will be in close proximity with each other. This will lead to elevated levels of interference being sensed by these access points, causing them to fall back from using wider channels to narrower channels. This is the case because channels with large bandwidths are accessed on a best effort basis. Let's understand this behavior in better detail with a cartoon example. The figure shows a network space with a dense deployment of Wi-Fi access points. The triangles denote the access points. The users are distributed uniformly in the network space denoted by circles. Let's assume for illustrative convenience that there are four non-overlapping wireless channels available. With the baseline deployment of Wi-Fi, we will assign one wireless channel per access point resulting in an arrangement that looks something like this. The four colors represent the four channels, and the color of an access point identifies the channel assigned to it. Let's consider AP28 in the middle, operating in the blue channel. The carrier sensing range of an access point is defined as the distance to which its transmissions may be heard. We can see that there are several co-channel access points within the CCA range of AP28, which means they all contend for the same channel, as well as interfere with each other's transmissions, thereby detrimentally impacting the performance of the network. An alternative to such a baseline deployment of Wi-Fi is to divide the access points into different groups and then distribute <coughs> the available channels among these groups. This forms the fundamental idea behind distributed MIMO or network MIMO. Let's understand the architecture of DMIMO Wi-Fi in better detail. We divide the functionality of the access point into two entities. First is a radio head, which is a simple remote radio front end whose only job is to transmit and receive wireless waveforms. All the heavy lifting when it comes to file layer signal processing, MAC layer channel condition distribution, <coughs> and so on, will be delegated to the processing unit, which could be thought of as the brain of the DMIMO group. The radio heads may be connected to the PU using either wired or wireless links. The beauty of distributed MIMO is that these radio heads are now synchronized, and they cooperatively form a single virtual transceiver array that facilitates joint transmission of these radio heads to simultaneously serve multiple users. This is the reason why this technology is called distributed multi-user MIMO. In the next couple of slides, I'll present uh, an outline of the dissertation and mention some of its key contributions. 
In the first section, we considered some challenges in realizing d MIMO Wi-Fi networks. Specifically, we focused on the problems of channel access and multi-user MIMO user selection and prescribed lightweight solutions to effectively address these challenges. <coughs> we also built a custom network simulator to study and compare the performance of d MIMO Wi-Fi networks with that of baseline deployments. Next, we implemented a d MIMO Wi-Fi group using software-defined radio platforms in the indoor orbit test by Delphin Lab. We use the implemented setup as a proof of concept of the proposed algorithms in section one. In the third section of the dissertation, we address dynamic resource management challenges germane to DMIMO Wi-Fi networks that are known to be NP-hard and only heuristic solutions exist in literature. We harness principles from deep reinforcement learning to effectively address these challenges and to achieve performances that are better than that of heuristic solutions. Finally, we extended the architecture of DMIMO to dense Wi-Fi networks operating in millimeter wave frequency bands with large channel bandwidths. <coughs> Our objective in this section was to study and quantify the performance improvements that the DMIMO architecture brought to these networks. We also wanted to understand if DMIMO was always the best strategy to adopt to improve user throughput performance in these networks. Turns out that is not the case. In fact, we proposed a <coughs> guideline to design future networks as hybrids of both baseline as well as DMIMO configurations with the ability of dynamically switching between these two arrangements as and when appropriate. All right. Let's move on to section one, which addresses channel access and multi-user MIMO user selection in DMIMO Wi-Fi. I'll begin this section with an overview of what these challenges are. Then we'll move on to a discussion of the proposed lightweight solutions to effectively address these challenges. I'll conclude the section with an account of the results that we obtained from extensive network simulations. First, the problem of channel access. At the heart of Wi-Fi transmissions is a protocol called carrier sensing multiple access with collision avoidance, or CSMACA, that mediates channel access among Wi-Fi access points. That is, it decides which access point gets access to which channel at what time. On a high level, CSMACS works like this. An access point has to first sense the energy in the channel. If the sensed energy is lower than a threshold, then the channel is declared to be idle. The access point is free with transmissions in the channel. Otherwise, the channel is declared to be busy. The access point has to enter into a backup procedure and then contend for the channel again. CSMACA works fine in case of a baseline Wi-Fi access point with co-located antennas. This is the case because these antennas are likely to share a common consistent view of the channel occupancy state. What do I mean by channel occupancy? I mean whether the channel is idle or busy. In case of DMIMO, however, radio heads are located at different spatial positions. Therefore, it is likely that the channel occupancy states viewed by these radio heads are different. Let's understand the scenario in better detail. Let's consider the group that is shown on the slide, which consists of four radio heads located at different spatial positions. Let's assume the presence of an already active co-channel group on the top right. Notice how only radio head two senses the channel to be busy, whereas radio heads one, three, and four find the same channel to be idle owing to their distance of separation from the already active group. In this scenario, the question to be answered is, should the DMIMO group declare the channel to be busy just because one of the radio heads found the channel to be busy, or can it go ahead with transmission from the other three radio heads which found the same channel to be idle? In other words, the channel access procedure of Wi-Fi has to be updated for it to work in a DMIMO cell. The next challenge of interest is multi-user MIMO user selection. Let's consider the group that is shown in this slide. It consists of four radio heads equipped with two antennas, which means the group can support eight simultaneous views. <laughs> when the number of users associated with the group is greater than eight, it becomes important to select users to serve in every transmission opportunity, or TXOP. The selected users may look as shown in grouping one, or grouping n, or any other grouping that one can think of. What is important, however, to, is to understand that the topology of selected users will have a direct impact on the throughput performance of the DMIMO group. It is designed that we select users to serve in every TXOP that will maximize group throughput performance. It is also desired that the user selection process does not incur a prohibitively high channel sounding overhead. In the next slide, I'll explain what channel sounding is and why it is important to reduce this overhead. Now, before I move on to the slide, I'd like to quickly mention that there might exist other network performance quantities of interest that need to be optimized. For instance, minimizing latency of the users and any other quantity. We arbitrarily chose group throughput performance as our key performance indicator that needed to be optimized or maximized. All right, so the objective is to select users to serve in every TXOP that will maximize group throughput performance. To optimally select users, the DMIMO group or the PU requires accurate estimates of channel state information between the radio heads and all of the users associated with the DMIMO group. In Wi-Fi, channel state information is obtained by a procedure called channel sounding. 
It is important to understand that channel sounding is an overhead and it negatively impacts throughput performance of the D MIMO group. Let's understand how throughput is related to different quantities. First is the amount of useful data transferred in the TXOP, which is D, the amount of time that is spent on useful data transmission, which is TD, and the amount of time that is spent on channel sounding, which is T overhead. The duration of a TXOP is split into two, TD and T overhead. So if you spend a lot of time in performing channel sounding, then the amount of time that is left for useful data transmission goes down, <coughs> which brings D down, and hence the throughput R. Did you say what group throughput performance was? It's the sum throughput of the demand group. So it is decided that we, the amount of channel sounding overhead involved in the user selection process is, is reduced so that group throughput performance may be increased or improved. Okay. So let's move on to the prescribed solutions to effectively address these challenges. First, the problem of channel access. So as we discussed before, since a DMIMO group consists of radio heads located at different spatial positions, it is likely that the channel occupancy states viewed by these radio heads are different. To resolve channel contention for the DMIMO group, it becomes important to assimilate the channel sensing observations from these different radio heads. To this end, the PO maintains independent groups of one or more radio heads called sensing groups. A radio head may be part of multiple sensing groups. The channel occupancy state that is viewed by a radio head is maintained as a Boolean variable, a zero indicating that the channel was sensed as idle, and a one indicating that the channel was sensed as busy. The composite channel state of a sensing group is obtained by combining the channel states of the constituent radio heads by using either the Boolean OR or the Boolean AND operators. In the next slide, I'll explain how to form these sensing groups. We propose three different strategies to form sensing groups. I'll use the example of a DMIMO group consisting of four radio heads to explain these three strategies. In the first strategy, we create a single sensing group which consists of all of the four radio heads that belong to the DMIMO group. The composite channel state of the sensing group is obtained by combining the channel states of these four radio heads using the Boolean AND operator. What this means is that the composite channel state will be declared as busy only if all the four radio heads find the channel to be busy. In the next strategy, we maintain as many sensing groups as the number of radio heads. So in our example, we will create four sensing groups with each group consisting of one radio head. The composite channel state of this sensing group is essentially the same as the channel occupancy state of this radio head. We call the third strategy to be the power set. So in our example scenario of a DMIMO group consisting of four radio heads, we create 15 different sensing groups which considers all possible combinations of these radio heads. The composite channel state of a sensing group, composite channel state of a sensing group is obtained by performing a Boolean R operation of the channel states of the constituent radio heads. Clearly, strategy three is the most location aware because it considers all possible combinations of radio heads. However, strategy three entails maintaining an exponential number of sensing groups and the associated back off time. <coughs> we have extensively compared the performance of these three strategies in terms of achieved channel access performance and presented the results in the dissertation document. We additionally proposed new mechanisms to enhance channel access performance in DMIMO in the form of extension of transmission group, combination of winning sensing groups, and so on. I'm not going over those details in this presentation in the interest of time. However, for our scenarios of interest, we use strategy two to resolve channel contention among DMIMO groups for two reasons. A, ease of implementation, and B, the difference in channel access performance between strategies two and three for our scenarios of interest was negligibly small. All right. So this slide describes the timeline of a channel access procedure described by the CSMACA protocol for a baseline web access point. The difference or update for DMIMO here, here is that the determination of channel occupancy state as either busy or <coughs> idle now depends on the co composite <coughs> channel state of a sensing group. We could use one of the three strategies that we discussed in the previous slide to form a sensing group as well as determine its composite channel state. All right, let's now move on to the next challenge, which is multi-user MIMO user selection. So as we discussed before, when the number of users associated with the group is greater than the number of streams that the group can support, it becomes important to select users to serve in every TXOP that will maximize group throughput performance. It is also desired that the amount of channel sounding overhead involved in the user selection process is reduced. Let's consider the group that is shown in this slide. We claim that selecting users to serve in a TXOP that cluster around a radio head is not desirable. We would rather choose users which look like the figure on the right. In the next slide, I'll explain or rather provide the substantiation behind this claim, which will also form the foundation of our proposed user selection algorithm. <coughs> All right. So to support multi-user MIMO service to the user, 
the D MIMO group or the PU will have to precode the transmission from the radio heads so that interstream interference is cancelled out. The transfer precoding algorithm of interest in our work is zero forcing owing to its ease of implementation. So zero forcing cancels out interstream interference, but at the expense of some useful signal gains in the streams as well. When the user is to be served in a TXOP cluster around a radio head, the composite channel matrix between the radio heads and the selected users will be ill-conditioned. This will lead to zero forcing sacrificing more useful signal gains in the streams to these users to cancel out interstream interference. This will lead to lower signal to noise ratios and hence lower throughput being delivered to them, <coughs> them being the users. On the other hand, if we choose users which do not cluster around the radio head, and better yet, if we choose users which have similar channel conditions, then the composite channel matrix between the radio heads and the selected users will be well conditioned. Therefore, zero forcing will not have to sacrifice a lot of useful signal gains in order to achieve interstream interference cancellation. This will lead to higher SNRs and hence higher throughput being delivered to the users. This forms the fundamental idea with which uh, we developed our user selection algorithm. We exploit the concept of weak channel reciprocity to effectively select users to serve in every TXOP in order to maximize group throughput performance. I'll explain what weak channel reciprocity is in this slide. Let's consider a radio head with M antennas and a user with K antennas. Let's assume there's <coughs> an uplink transmission from the user to the radio head. Based on this uplink transmission, the radio head cannot create an M by K uplink channel matrix estimate. The Frobenius norm of the channel matrix is the uplink channel gain. Right? Let's assume <coughs> there's a radio head with two associated users, user one and user two, with respective uplink channel gains U1 and U2. Let's denote the downlink channel gains from this radio head to these two users as D1 and D2. What weak channel reciprocity claims is that if u1 is greater than u2, then d1 must be greater than d2. So we not claim uh, that means it, uh, this theory claims proportionality in channel gains in uplink and downlink. So note that we're not claiming exact reciprocity of the uplink and downlink via the channel in terms of the channel coefficients. All we are claiming is that uplink and downlink channel gains will be proportional. So we exploit this theory to select users to serve in every TXOP in order to maximize group throughput performance. Note that we can actually use weak channel reciprocity in case of Wi-Fi because Wi-Fi is a TDD system or a time division duplex system which uses the same channel for uplink and downlink. Right? So more details of the algorithm can be found in the dissertation document. The beauty of the algorithm is that it does not request channel sounding feedback or CSI estimation feedback from any of the associated users with the DMMO group during the selection phase. This is the reason why this algorithm is lightweight. All right. So this slide describes a timeline of a typical DMIMO downlink transmission in one TXOP. First, the channel contention for the group has to be resolved, followed by selecting the users to be served in a TXOP. This will be followed by optimal power allocation. So in this phase, the PU has to decide how to optimally allocate power among concurrently served streams subject to the per group maximum power constraint so that group throughput performance is maximized while ensuring that interstream interference is cancelled out. <coughs> we formulated this as an optimization problem, and we have solved it effect effectively or efficiently using water filling techniques. All right. Now, time for results. All right. So, first, let's focus on the performance of one DMIMO group. The focus of this subsection is to demonstrate the efficacy of the proposed user selection algorithm in selecting users to serve in every TXOP that will maximize group throughput performance. So, this is the group of interest. It consists of four radio heads equipped with two antennas each which means the group can support eight simultaneous streams. <coughs> we distributed 40 users uniformly in the network space. Other simulation parameters of interest are listed in the table. The signal-to-noise ratio to MCS index to five-layer data rate mapping was performed according to the IEEE 802.11x standards. I'll explain what MCS index is in the next slide. First, let's focus on the distribution of the sum throughput of the DMIMO group. So, so Neil, sure. um, the, so, so the physical system now is <coughs> four access points, and it, they're going to talk to all of those mobile devices. Users. So it's users. focusing on just one DMMO group for now. We'll then move on to the network so this simulations. Is, this is one group. One group. And somehow that's that's the whole universe for, for the moment. For, for, the, for the moment, yeah. So we're trying to coordinate the transmission from the radio heads and achieve the best performance if you can get out of it. <coughs> All right, so let's first consider the distribution of some throughput of the DMIMO group. Note that the throughput numbers that we have plotted here are not just five layer data rates. We also incorporated the channel sounding <coughs> overhead while computing these numbers. Since the DMIMO group can support eight simultaneous streams, we considered two different variants of user selection. 
First is selecting four users per DXLP and serving each user with two streams, the results of your priority in blue, or selecting eight users per DXLP and serving each user <coughs> with one stream, the results of your priority in orange. To compare the performance of the proposed user selection algorithm, we considered two other technical selecting users. One is random selection, where, it, where we would randomly select users to serve in every TXOP. And the other is oracle user selection, wherein we assume the presence of an all-knowing oracle that could optimally select users to serve in every TXOP that will maximize group throughput performance. All right. So from the results, it's very evident that the proposed algorithms perform better than Proposed algorithms perform better than random selection. No, uh, in fact, our simulation results re reveal an improvement of up to 50% in median group throughput performance with the proposed algorithm over baseline, I mean, over random selection. Notice the difference in peak throughput numbers between the orange and the blue curves. This can be ascribed to the fact that performing channel sounding for eight users incurs a higher overhead compared to performing channel sounding for four users, which will negatively impact the group throughput performance. It is also encouraging to see that the proposed algorithm performs close to optimality. The difference in median throughput performance between the proposed algorithm and optimal user selection was a mere 10%. Next, let's look at the distribution of MCS indices achieved at the usage. So MCS index stands for Modulation Encoding Scheme Index. So, so Neil, this is really like you found one group of four or eight users mm -hmm. out of this, like that that sketch of like 30 users? No, we, uh, we iterate through all the users. So we make sure that every single user gets served. Uh, so how, so, um, so somehow in random user selection, you just run this many times with many random subsets, yes. right? Yeah. But then with like some specified user selection, how do you make sure, did you say how everyone gets served? How, how we, you, we maintain two different lists to make sure that everyone moves, I mean, gets assigned. So, I mean, that, that goes into the inner workings of the algorithm itself. So we make sure that every single user gets served by maintaining two different lists. One is called the unserved list and the other, other is called the served list. So one, every single time a, a, a user gets served, it gets moved from the unserved list to the served list. And then we iterate through the unserved list completely before looping back again. And do you optimize over how you decide what the structure or the sequence of, yes. of service? So that is what the algorithm does. We make sure that the selected users have similar channel conditions and they do not cluster around just one video head. Uh, is there about a multi-channel profile? Um, is it largely line of sight or? Oh, so we, we use the, come on. Serving somebody else now. <laughs> so we use the 802.11 PGN channel model, which has both the LOS as well as non LMS. Okay. Do you have any proportional fairness going on? Yeah, so uh, there is proportional fairness in it. We actually have results for fairness index as well. So we part of the James Fairness Index of the throughput distribution among the users. I don't have the results here. Uh, so, but I can show it to you later. It, it, uh, the proposed algorithm makes sure that every single user gets it. Okay. So when you say randomly, do this from the, you pick ra uh, randomly from the answer of users? Yeah, so with, with random, you would select four random users from this, these 40 users at any TXOP. And then put them in the served list. list. And yeah. then, right, yeah. so you don't have mm -hmm. any repetitions. Exactly. <coughs> so, so we have the distribution of MCS indices. So as I was saying, MCS index stands for Modulation and Coding Scheme Index. And it dictates the mod uh, coding rate as well as the modulation type to be used in transmissions to a certain user. So if the MCS index of a user is high, then a higher coding rate as well as a higher order modulation scheme can be used in transmission <coughs> to that user. Yet again, we can see that the proposed algorithms achieve better distributions of MCS indices compared to random selection. Notice how the orange curve gets the best distribution of MCS index. Right? So recall that orange curve corresponds to the case when we selected eight users per TXOP and served each user with one stream. But recall that each user was equipped with two antennas, which means we can employ receiver diversity combining techniques to boost the signal to noise ratio at the users and hence the achieved MCS index. We used equal gain combining as a diversity combining technique at the users. All right, so this is, let's, have, let's now move on to network simulation results. This is our network, si si I mean, si simulation scenario of interest. It consists of 64 access points deployed close to each other with an intersite distance of 10 meters. So in case of baseline, these triangles will be independent Wi-Fi access points. 
In case of T-MIMO, we group four neighboring beta hairs together to form groups in the shapes of squares. We assume the availability of four non-overlapping channels, each of bandwidth 80 megahertz in the 5 gigahertz bands. These five, four colors represent the four channels. Um, other simulation parameters of interest are listed in the table, and they're typical of network simulations in Wi-Fi. Right. First, let's compare the channel access performance of baseline and DMIMO configurations. This figure here describes the channel access characteristics of baseline by access points. What do I mean by channel access times? It's the duration for which an access point obtained access to a channel. So how do we interpret this plot? Right? The x-axis descri uh, describes the duration of a network simulation run, which was 100 milliseconds. The y-axis denotes the index of access points. So we had 64 access points going from 0 to 63. Uh, how do we interpret this graph? So let's say we consider AP40 here. The length of a bar here indicates the duration for which access point 40 obtained access to the yellow channel in the simulation instance. Right? So these four colors again represent the four channels. Uh, clearly, from this figure, it is evident that the channel access times for baseline wave access points were irregular, they were non-uniform, and they were inconsistent, and there are logic gaps between consecutive channel accesses for any access point. This is the case because in case of baseline, co-channel access points will be in close proximity with each other, leading to higher levels of channel contention among these access points. In case of DMIMO, however, there's a stark difference. The results look much more nice. There's a nicer structure to the characteristics. And there are fewer gaps between consecutive channel accesses. This is the case because of the coordination of radio heads within a DMIMO group, as well as the updated channel access procedure that we proposed to resolve channel contention among DMIMO groups. In fact, our simulation results revealed an improvement of up to 122% in average channel occupancy with DMIMO compared to baseline. Right. Next, let's uh, study two network performance quantities of interest from the user's perspective, the MCS index achieved of the users, and the distribution of throughput delivered to the users. And in both the cases, we can see that the DMIMO arrangement is able to outperform baseline. In fact, we compare the performance of DMIMO and baseline over several network performance quantities. And across the board, we can see that DMIMO is able to achieve a much better performance than baseline, achieving improvements of up to 350% in certain cases. I had a big reveal for this. Okay. So uh, this, this slide describes the spatial distribution of user throughput in case of baseline as well as DMIMO configurations. Uh, so how do we interpret these heat maps? Regions which are blue achieve lower throughput compared to regions which are more in the red uh, orange zone. So visibly, it's pretty obvious that DMIMO is able to achieve a much better distribution of user throughput compared to baseline. In fact, our simulation results revealed an improvement of up to 3.5 times in median user throughput performance with DMIMO compared to baseline. Something that I forgot to mention was all the results that we obtained were from 3,000 different network simulations, with each simulation consisting of a different random drop of users. So I, I believe that all the results that I just described make a very strong case for the use of distributed multi-user MIMO as a technology to improve performance of next generation Wi-Fi networks with dense access point deployments. Question. Yes. Um, <coughs> in this case, uh, is that right with the DMIMO deployment, your co-channel interferers are farther away? Yes. So, so okay. Can <coughs> So this is how, really, okay. So this is how the channels were assigned. The, red, the groups of red channels were spaced far apart from each other. Right. So they assume people practically isolated from each other. Well, they're not. There's still co-channel interference because if they were practically isolated, uh, you would see straight lines without any interruptions in these channel access times, right? So there's still some co-channel interference going on, but DMM was able to handle the co-channel interference much better than baseline. So you mentioned some uh, channel sensing s different strategies. Yes. So in this particular result, which strategy two? Which strategy, strategy two? So strategy three provides the same result, but then strategy three has entails more computational complexity. So we'd much rather use strategy two because it's easier. So so strategy two means that we maintain independent sensing groups. We keep each one consisting of a radio head. So each radio head makes its own decision. Sensing group. Yeah, no, no. Then we have uh, additional techniques of combining winning sensing groups, next sensing group, and so on. Okay, so that combination strategy yeah, yes. helps uh, achieve a better sense. Okay. So that you have a plot with like a CDF based on MCS index, right? But uh, 
Ah, okay, so it's the one that's really looking for something, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So the improvement is about, I mean, there are many different cases, but the mean average user throughput performance improvement is about 191% with uh, D1. Uh, another question. Sure. You mentioned that uh, the uh, as far as MCS selection is concerned, mm -hmm. the uh, eight separate user is the best. Yes. But it's throughput is not necessarily the best. That's exactly. purely an overhead issue, right? Exactly. Okay. exactly. Because of the channel sounding involved in performing channel sounding for eight users. It also depends on the duration of the DXOP as well. So if you can enlarge the duration of the DXOP, then the impact of the overhead comes down. Because it's only occupying a fraction of the DXOP. Uh, did you also say that um, you select uh, users who have approximately equal uh, channel, channel gains? Channel gains, yeah. So you need to have sufficient number of users to kind of achieve that. Yes. Yes. How do you take into account? Do you also take into account frequency selectivity because it's a wide band channel, multi-user? Uh, oh, for the simulation scenario, we assume everyone's compatible with the frequency band. Like you know, there's no selectivity of a user to a certain channel. But I mean, that is a good question. How do we yeah. incorporate frequency selectivity? We, have, we haven't considered that. I have a question about uh, the hardware uh, issue we get to do. Oh, you get, get yeah, it. We have okay. implementation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. So next, let's move on to the implementation of a DMM Wi-Fi group in an indoor experimental test bed. Uh, I'd like to quickly run through this section in the interest of time uh, for two reasons. One, uh, I'd like to spend more time than the last two sections, and two. We have discussed this section in detail in the proposal presentation, so I just like to intend, I intend for the few slides to be a quick you know, review of the results from our experimental evaluations. So we implemented a DMMO Wi-Fi group using software-defined radio platforms in the indoor orbit testbed at Bin Lab. This is the picture of the implemented testbed itself. We have four radio heads and 20 users, as shown in the figure. Uh, the, PUs were uh, the PU was implemented using a server node in the testbed, and connect we connected the PU to the radio heads using Ethernet links. The radio heads as well as the users were implemented using universal software radio peripherals, the USRPs B210 and x tens. <coughs> this is the picture of the USRP with the attached antennas. All right. So we achieved tight level of synchronization among the radio heads in both phase and time using a GPS discipline clock reference system called the OctoClock. The OctoClock provided 10 megahertz reference signals and a pulse per second signal to tightly synchronize the radio heads in both phase as well as time which is necessary to achieve joint multi-user memory downlink transmission, right? Okay, so this slide describes the timeline of one experimental evaluation. Each experimental run lasts for the duration of one transmission opportunity, or TXOP. In the first phase, the users to be served in this TXOP would be selected. This is followed by channel sounding. So recall that to support multi-user memo service to the users, the PU will have to pre-code the transmission so that inter-stream interference or inter-user interference is canceled out. To perform transmit pre-coding, the, the PU requires accurate estimates of channel information between the radio heads and the users. This information is obtained by the procedure of channel sounding. So a radio head sends out a null data packet, or NDP, which consists of reference pilot signals in the downlink to the users. The users would estimate the channel between themselves and the radio head and send these estimates back to the radio heads in the uplink. The radio heads take turns in performing channel sounding. Once the channel sounding phase is complete, the PU can then commence its operations, which include determination of the pre-coding pre pre means to be used by the radio heads, determination of the MCS indices to be used in the transmitters in the concurrently served streams, and so on. Once these operations have been completed, the radio heads can then proceed with joint multi-user memory downlink transmission to the users. So all of these operations have to be completed within one TXOP, or transmission opportunity. Right. So, sure. Sending uh, their feedback simultaneously over the air. Uh, so we assume the presence of a like an oracle which can take the uh, so the the feedback from the user to the radio heads is not wireless. We just uh, oh. wire them through the to the to the radio heads. Okay. Okay. So these are the results from experimental evaluations. We conducted our experiments overnight to minimize the dynamicity in the wireless channel as well as the indoor testbed environment. Uh, to compare the performance of the proposed user selection algorithm, we again compared, I mean, again considered two other technical selecting users. One was random selection, and second was optimal oracle based user selection, as we discussed in the previous section. We have two network performance quantities of interest the distribution of MCS index achieved with the users, and the distribution of group throughput performance. Both the cases 
proposed user selection algorithm is able to achieve a better performance than random selection. In fact, our simulation results revealed an improvement of up to 60% in median group throughput performance with the proposed algorithm over random. It is also encouraging to see that the proposed algorithm performs close to optimal. Uh, in fact, the difference between the proposed algorithm and oracle selection was a mere 13%. So these results, along with the results from, our, from section one, jointly demonstrate the effectiveness of the proposed user selection algorithm in selecting users to serve in MBTXOP to maximize group throughput performance in a near optimal manner. Okay? The beauty of the algorithm is that it does not request channel sounding feedback from any of the associated users during the selection phase, which is why this algorithm is likely. All right, can I move on to the third section? So in this section, we address dynamic resource management challenges in the MIMO Wi-Fi networks using deep reinforcement learning. So the objective in this section was to impart intelligence to the MIMO Wi-Fi networks to empower them with an autonomous adaptation to dynamic network conditions. We considered two dynamic resource management challenges germane to the MIMO Wi-Fi networks. First is the problem of channel assignment. Consider a network of interest consisting of n number of DMIMO groups and k number of available channels, such that k is less than n. We'd like to understand how to assign these k channels to these n groups so that best, I mean, so that user throughput performance is maximized. The next challenge of interest is dynamic radio head clustering. Right? In the scenarios that we have considered till now, we grouped four neighboring radio heads together to form d memo groups of the shapes of squares. However, it is not clear if that is indeed the most <coughs> optimal clustering policy to adopt to improve user throughput performance especially when users are distributed non-uniformly in the network space. So these two problems have been shown to be NP hard and only heuristic solutions exist in literature. We'd like to explore the potential of using reinforcement learning techniques to effectively address these challenges. So in the next couple of slides, I'd like to discuss a few network scenarios that motivate, or rather, that clarify the notion of dynamic resource management in DMIMO Wi-Fi networks and also motivate the use of deep re reinforcement learning to address these challenges. First, the problem of vanilla channel assignment. Consider the network that is shown in the slide, which consists of 16 DMIMO groups, all assigned the same red channel. Let's assume for illustrative convenience that there are four non-overlapping wireless channels available. We'd like to understand how to assign these four channels to these 16 groups to attain the best user throughput performance. The desired arrangement may look something like the figure on the right. So what is the rationale behind that arrangement? Uh, we'd like to space out co-channel groups far apart from each other so that co-channel interference as well as channel contention among the groups may be minimized. We'd like to understand if we can use a reinforcement learning agent that can help take the network from the arrangement on the left <coughs> to the arrangement on the right. Now you may be wondering, why do we need reinforcement learning if you already know what to do? That is a legitimate question. The purpose of this exercise is to demonstrate the effectiveness of reinforcement learning agents in solving simple enough problems like these before extending them to more complex input scenarios. So when I say when I call them simple, I'm not talking about the computational hardness of the problem. I'm talking about the simplicity of the network scenario itself. Let's consider a slightly more network, a complex network scenario. The objective is still the same. We have to assign channels to the DMIMO groups, but now there's a band of space around this network where an external Wi-Fi interferers may randomly appear. So let's consider an interferer appearing as shown in the figure, operating in the blue channel. The channel assignment of group 15 has to be changed from blue to some other channel because it's located right next to this interferer. Okay? But an update to the channel assignment of group 15 will trigger updates to channel assignments of other groups as well in sort of a ripple effect. So we'd like to understand if we can use a reinforcement learning agent that can help update the channel assignments of these groups in response to the presence of external Wi-Fi interference. To make things complicated, we have three issues. One, there may be more than one interferer in the vicinity. Two, the interferers may be mobile, and three, the channels assigned to these interferers may change from time to time. So the reinforcement learning agent that we use to that we use must be able to address all of these issues simultaneously. The third challenge of interest is particularly challenging. Uh, so in the scenarios that we've considered till now, we rather conveniently grouped four neighboring radio heads together to form D MIMO groups of the shapes of squares. Right? Let's call this clustering policy to be adjacent grouping. It is not clear, however, when, yeah, I mean, it's not clear, however, if adjacent grouping is indeed the most optimal clustering policy, especially when users are distributed non-uniformly in the network space. So let's consider this, non, uh, this particular scenario in this slide. We have a dense concentration of users around a few radio heads, whereas the rest of the space is scantily populated. 
A practical example of the scenario would be an office space like this and the presence of a conference room or a meeting room here where users typically congregate. Right? In this scenario, with adjacent grouping, this dense concentration of users has come to be served by just one group, which is group six. However, if we split these, split these users to be served by two different groups, group six and group seven, as shown in the bottom figure, we can improve user throughput performance. So we'd like to understand if we can use a reinforcement learning agent that can help update the clustering of radio heads in response to the distribution of users in the network space. To make things more complicated, the users may be mobile, and hence the distribution of users in the network space will change from time to time. Okay. To address these challenges effectively, we implemented, or rather built, a deep, uh, a deep reinforcement learning framework. So at the heart of this framework lies the DMIMO network simulator that I introduced in part one. Uh, the framework also consists of a learning agent. The learning agent chooses an action based on the current state of the network environment and feeds it to the network simulator. The simulator receives the action, incorporates the action to the network environment, simulates network performance, and generates results. Based on the generated results, the agent would then receive a reward for its previously <coughs> chosen action. If the action that the agent chose previously resulted in an improvement in network performance, the agent would receive a positive reward. Else, the agent would receive a negative reward or a penalty. The objective of the agent is to maximize the cumulative rewards that it receives from the environment. Based on the new state or the updated state of the network environment, the agent would then choose the next action and the whole cycle continues <coughs> until one learning episode that terminates. We've implemented our learning framework using state-of-the-art platforms. We have a wrapper of OpenAI Gem around the network simulator. The simulator itself was implemented using Python. The learning agent was implemented as a neural network using TensorFlow. Right. So in this slide, I'd like to spend some time in explaining how our environments of interest are different from typical reinforcement learning environments. In our learning framework, learning occurs episodically, and each episode consists of a fixed number of actions. This is different from typical reinforcement learning environments like games, for instance, Atari or Ping Pong or any other game. In those environments, there exists a well-defined condition to terminate one learning episode. That is, you either win the game or you lose the game. But in our scenarios of interest, our objective is to improve or maximize network performance, and hence there exists no clear condition to terminate an episode. Therefore, in order to actually terminate the learning episode and to constrain the duration of one learning episode, we limit the number of actions that the agent can perform on the network environment. The second aspect of difference is the vastness of state and action spaces. So in, in case of our vanilla channel assignment problem, the cardinality of state space is 4 to the power of 16, and the size of the action space is 64. In case of environments with such large state and action spaces, typical reinforcement learning algorithms do not work well. For instance, consider using Q-learning, a popular reinforcement learning algorithm to address vanilla channel assignment. Q-learning would entail maintaining a Q-table of dimension 4 to the power of 16 times 64, which entails an exponential complexity in both storage as well as computation time. This issue is popularly known as cursive dimensionality. To circumvent this issue, we implemented our learning agent as a neural network to model the nonlinear relationship between the input state and the output action. This is the reason why this technology or framework is called deep reinforcement learning. It is a synergistic combination of deep learning in the neural network and the reinforcement learning framework. We have, there are two classifications of deep reinforcement, learning, deep reinforcement learning algorithms. There's value iteration based and policy iteration based. I'm not going into the details of how these classes are different in the interest of time. <coughs> However, for our scenarios of interest, we use policy iteration based methods because they perform well in case of environments with large action spaces. All right. So let's move on to the results that we've obtained from extensive online training. First, the problem of channel assignment. So this is how the network starts out at each episode. We have 16 groups, all assigned the same red channel. We assume the availability of four non-overlapping wireless channels, and the objective is to understand how to assign these channels to these groups. Okay. The implemented training algorithm is policy gradients reinforced, and this figure describes the learning performance of the reinforced agent. I'd like to spend some time in explaining the conventions in this figure because they apply to subsequent results as well. Uh, oh, uh, the performance quantity of interest in this scenario is the throughput of the 30th percentile of users. Again, an arbitrary choice. We could have chosen any other quantity, and the agent would have trained to optimize that. Right. So the lighter lines here represent the per episode throughput numbers, whereas the bold lines depict the moving averages of these throughput numbers over a window of 50 episodes. All right. 
The red line corresponds to the case of random channel assignment, wherein we would randomly assign channels to the groups in every episode. The blue line corresponds to the case of heuristic assignment, wherein we assign groups to these, I mean, we assign channels to these groups such that co channel groups are spaced far apart from each other, as we discussed previously. The green line corresponds to the case of reinforced agent. Clearly, uh, we can see that the performance of the reinforced agent converges to that of uh, the heuristic assignment. Hence, it is safe to say that reinforced agent was successful in effectively assigning channels to the DMIMO groups in order to attain the best use of throughput performance. We also wanted to understand the impact of certain hyperparameters on the learning performance of the reinforced agent. An important hyperparameter in reinforcement learning terminology is discount factor that determines how an agent values rewards. An agent with a discount factor close to zero prioritizes immediate rewards, whereas an agent with a discount factor close to one values rewards farther in the future. So from this result, it's evident that agents with lower agents with lower discount factors demonstrated better learning performance compared to agents with higher discount factors. We'd like to understand why that is the case. Okay. So in our learning framework, the agent received rewards for every single action that it performed on the network environment over the course of an episode. This is different from typical reinforcement learning environments like games, in which the agent would receive one big final reward at the end of an episode depending on whether the game was won or lost. In other words, in our scenarios, all the rewards that the agent received over the course of an episode are all equally important, <coughs> and hence it is in the best interest of the agent to prioritize immediate rewards. This is the reason why agents with lower discount factors demonstrate better learning performance compared to agents with higher discount factors. Right. The next scenario of interest is again channel assignment, but in the, uh, but in the presence of external Wi-Fi interference. Each learning episode starts off with this sort of a channel assignment. Uh, the locations of the interference as well as the channel sent to the interference were changed at the end of each episode. Uh, to compare the performance of reinforced agent in this particular scenario, we also considered a popular heuristic-based channel assignment scheme that is designed specifically for enterprise Wi-Fi networks which are centrally managed. That scheme is called HSUM, and it models channel assignment as a weighted graph building problem. Uh, once again, we can see that the uh, reinforced agent is able to match the performance of uh, HM algorithm. In fact, in several episodes, it's able to beat the performance of the uh, HM algorithm. Now we scaled up the complexity. Now we have three Wi-Fi interferes in the vicinity, not just one. And even in that case, uh, the reinforced agent was successful in updating the channel assignments of these groups in response to the presence of external Wi-Fi interference, and was able to either meet the performance of HM or beat it in several episodes. All right. Can you go back to that one where you show oh, the, the learning agent gets up to yep. the good performance? Yeah. So, so um, like, you know, like, so it looks like, oh, it, it, it does really well by the time you get, like, to 800 episodes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. so, so how long are, does it take? How long in real time is 800 episodes? That's a good question. So uh, it all depends on uh, how we want to approach this, right? Like, do we want to train this algorithm offline and then deploy it online in a different, you know, in a practical scenario, or do you want to train it online with every single, you know, deployment of users, right? So in our example, we did it op we did it simulation based. So we had to simulate the network in every single episode and get the performance results, and then let the agent decide what the next action should be. So in that case, each episode took around 50, episodes, 50 seconds. Like each learning episode took 50 seconds. 50 seconds? seconds yeah. Of, of actual, no, uh, of our time, not network time, our time. Wow. So, so our time is like if you measured how long it yeah. takes to transmit right. and receive and all that. And the training also, the training and of the, the agent as well. Yeah. So I guess, I, I guess, so. Um, so that seems kind of maybe too slow, right? It is. Like it depends on. So we were limited in our computation resources as well. No, no. Okay. So what I'm trying to get at is this question of whether, if you imagine you can do the computations arbitrarily mm -hmm. fast, mm -hmm. right? But like somehow this is learning essentially where the users are located, more or less the and the, the groups, yes and the and dynamics like of the, how the channel the groups would interfere with each other. Right. And. And so, so if somehow this learning period is fast relative to how long it takes for the users to move around and be in a different configuration, sure. then this is really good. Sure. So, so what do we think? <coughs> is it 
if you say, oh, this takes 50 seconds, like... It, it takes 50 seconds practice because... practice, have the users in this scenario all, you know, shuffled around and moved here and there? So, or, I'll tell you how we simulated it. So, at the end of each learning episode, the users would move around. So, they, you change the locations of the users at the end of each episode. So, you could think of uh, users moving around at the end of 50, episodes, uh, 50 seconds, right? That's one way of looking at it. So uh, the reason why it took 50 seconds is because we were limited in our computation resources. We had to run this, sim so the main uh, overhead was the simulation of the network performance itself, not the training. Because we had to simulate the whole network's performance for about 100 milliseconds to get statistically convergent results. Right? So that right. took a long time. It's not about the reinforcement learning agent taking a long time to train uh, to optimize this. Right, so so it's really like find you know having them transmit stuff and finding out what exactly. throughputs you can get. Right, so if we can expedite that, or if we can completely get rid of it and use a practical system which can give us more more of a prompt feedback, then we can eliminate that overhead all altogether and then focus only on the training of the reinforcement learning agent. I think I'm a little confused now, so I'll I'll stop asking questions. So, so you say you can simulate where you actually simulate all possible scenarios yeah. and then kind of uh, pre-store them and then based upon whatever you know, is realized, you kind of implement that. Right, so... so, so the enumeration of uh, those, all those scenarios may be quite large, isn't it? Enumeration in what sense? You know, because you pre-simulate pre all the... Kind oh, of it's not pre-simulated. So we, all of this is online training. So you simulate the network, the agent decides what the action should be and it, it, it performs the action simulates the next time and so on. It's it, Everything is online. So what is it that the simulator does? I thought you said you have a network simulator that kind of tries to make a projection. Uh, right. what, what, what role does that play as opposed to getting feedback from the real network itself? So the network, what the simulator does is actually simulates the performance of the, rather it tries, it tries to just gauge how good the action is. Right? So it gets the action from the agent, it incorporates the action into the network environment and simulates it. Right, so it, it tries to understand how good the a, uh, agent that the, um, the action that the agent chose compared to before. I see. So it basically, for, for a given given action that the learning agent says, right. what would be the predicted performance? Exactly. Yeah, it's, I think you keep using the word simulation. I think you should say you're just doing a performance evaluation yeah. for a given action. Okay. That's what that's what the simulation is doing. Have you tried mobile users? Like yeah. the users moving? Yeah. So at, at the end of each episode. The users. So at the end of each episode, the users change their locations. So it's particularly challenging because the agent has to be aware of that as well. It's not just one particular fixed location of users. So the agent isn't actually learning locations. It's actually learning some kind of uh, meta partitioning of, oh, given a snapshot of users wherever they are, right. they have some I have to do this yeah. way of taking these, these things in and, and, and coming up with a, an assignment. Tough channels, yes. So, yeah, do, you, do you have a picture that shows after convergence, mm -hmm. what, what does the channel assignment look like? Uh, it looks like the heresy assignment. It does, yeah. Okay. Uh, Eric, did you have a and question? In this case, do you, uh, yes, do you have to select users for roughly equal to the channel uh, how much time are you actually simulating? No, I'm sorry, I guess he was talking. Okay, okay, okay. can you hold on for a minute, please? There was some, some other question. Okay. Yeah. What was it, sorry? Sorry, do you have an answer question? Oh, no, 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 please go ahead. Yeah. So even here, uh, you also uh, implement the same policy of, uh, in the, the uh, you know, DMIMO case, you select users who are roughly equal to channel for it. Oh, so in this case, we didn't consider that. We always assumed four users to be served by one group to make things a little more easy for the agent to work with. But in the other case, like uh, I'll go to the next uh, scenario where you had uh, like a you know, non-informed distribution of users. In that case, we had to consider that as well. Yes, Eric, sorry. Uh, yeah, you said an episode is, takes 50 seconds to simulate <coughs> all what kind of, how, how much time is that that you're actually simulating? Uh, so each network simulation lasts for the duration of 100 milliseconds in network time. And we had 50 episodes per, uh, I mean 50 actions per episode. So that, that's essentially 50 times one second, 50 seconds. It, 
Okay. You're simulating 50 seconds, or it took you 50 seconds? It to took me 50 seconds to get the... Uh, it, took, it took me 50 seconds to uh, complete one learning okay. episode. Each action uh, took about 100 milliseconds of network time. And to simulate 100 milliseconds of network time, it took me one second. I see. Okay. So, so it could actually potentially... Your simulator is slowing it down. I mean, exactly. Better. Exactly. So the simulator is the bottleneck. It's not the training of the DRL agent. Right. right. So if we can somehow expedite the simulation or performance evaluation, then that can help speed up this process tremendously. So, did that clarify your question or no? Um, I'm, uh, I'm, it's, it's asking the same question, and I'm still not sure I understand the answer. But I'm, but like, uh, I mean, I'll try to explain that again. No, I'm sorry. Just, just okay. I, I... All right, so we were at, we finished this. <coughs> this is dynamic radio head clustering. Uh, on the previous page, do, uh, same question. Do you have a picture showing, you know, once you turn on the uh, interferer, what does the China summit convert? I do. I don't have it in this presentation. I can show it to you after the presentation, okay. but I do have this. So dynamic radio head clustering. So each episode starts off with uh, this adjacent grouping strategy. There's non-uniform distribution around uh, of the users in the network space. So there's a dense concentration of users around a few radio heads. The locations of the users were changed at the end of each episode, thus modeling user mobility. The agent that we used for training in this case was a Bullpartinger agent designed specifically for large displayed action spaces. The agent used deep deterministic policy gradients for its training. So I guess this answers your question. So when we have a dense distribution of users here, we would have to perform user selection algorithm to choose users per TXOP. Okay. So this is the performance of the Wilpertinger agent. Uh, the red line corresponds to the random grouping case, wherein we would randomly select radio, radio heads together and cluster them. The blue line corresponds to the case of adjacent grouping. And the green line corresponds to the case of Wilpertinger agent. And yet again, we can see that the Wilpertinger agent is able to achieve a better performance than static adjacent grouping. Uh, in fact, we have demonstrated an improvement of up to 20% in throughput performance. So these results uh, make a strong case for the use of reinforcement learning agents to address dynamic resource management challenges in DMIMO Wi-Fi networks and achieve performances that are better than that of heuristic solutions. Okay? So this problem is particularly challenging because A, there is a dense, the, you know, it has to deal with non-uniform distribution of users, and B, the locations of the users was changed at the end of each episode. Again, increase the complexity. Right? Okay. So, like, move on to the final section, which deals with uh, distributed memory Wi-Fi networks in millimeter wave frequency bands. So, in this section, we extended the architecture of DMIMO to dense Wi-Fi networks operating in millimeter wave frequency bands with large channel bandwidth. Our objective, at least initially, was to study the performance improvements that the DMIMO architecture brought to these networks. So what started out as a pretty straightforward exercise of simulating network performance in both base 10 as well as DMMO configurations quickly turned into something highly interesting and it needed insights into potentially designing future networks as hybrids of both base 10 as well as DMMO configurations. I'll get to the interesting part very soon, but I'd like to set up the simulation scenario first. This figure should be familiar to us by now. Uh, the triangles denote base 10 life access points, uh, DMMO radio heads, everything is the same. The difference here, oh, the, we assume the availability of four non-overlapping channels, each of bandwidth 2 gigahertz in the 60 gigahertz bands. And we use the updated I mean, new path loss model called the 5GCM path loss model. So what makes the millimeter wave frequency regime interesting is that signals suffer higher path losses and they're susceptible to scattering and blockage losses. The 5GCM path loss model does a good job of capturing all these effects in a few analytical expressions. All right. So we have actually compared the performance of DMIMO and baseline in many, many different network performance quantities. But I'll, I'll present only two key results which, which I found interesting. The distribution of MCS in the attitude of the users and the distribution of throughput. I'll first focus on throughput because that's easier to explain. Uh, this plot describes the CDF of the throughput delivered to the users. And yet again, we can see that DMIMO is able to achieve a much better performance than baseline. In fact, achieving improvements of up to 395% in average user throughput performance compared to baseline. In case of MCS index, however, there's things get a lot more interesting. So up, up until MCS 9, DMIMO was able to achieve a better distribution of MCS indices than baseline. But after MCS 9, there's a very interesting crossover in trends of MCS indices. So what this suggests is that 
base time is able to somehow achieve very high MCA synthesis more number of times than D minor. So it is imperative that we understand the reasoning behind this, or the cause behind this effect, because such an understanding can yield insights into potentially designing future networks that can harness the benefits of both base time as well as D minor configurations. So we want to understand this behavior in better detail. We studied many different quantities of interest, but what gave us a major breakthrough was the study of distances between an access point or a radio head and its associated user. So this triangle represents a baseline access point or a DMIMO radio head, and the circle represents the user. Notice the difference in heights between the two, quantity, uh, two entities. So the, difference, the distance between them is three-dimensional. Right? This figure plots the histogram of these distances at which different MCS indices were obtained user, different MCS indices were obtained at the user. Uh, the, the colors, different colors correspond to different MCS indices. Our region of interest is highlighted by this enclosure. We focus on those scenarios where the distance between a user and its associated access point was small. So in that distance range, we can see that baseline is able to achieve very high MCS indices at the user. Notice how the dark red and the brown lines dominate over other curves. But in the same distance range, we can see that DMM was able to achieve MCS show the least number of times. Notice how the brown line is located all the way down the bottom. In fact, in that distance range, MCS indices between seven and nine dominate. MCS indices between seven and nine dominate. So this gives us a starting point in understanding the behavior that we discussed in the previous slide. The next slide will make that understanding more concrete. So recall that to support multi-user memo service to the users, the DMIMO group will have to pre-call the transmission from the video net so that interstream interference is canceled out. The traffic recording algorithm of interest in our work is zero forcing, owing to its ease of implementation. So zero forcing cancels out the stream interference, but at the expense of some useful signal gains in the stream as well. Let's consider this scenario where a user is located very close to a radio head. Since the group has to serve all these four users simultaneously, zero forcing will have to sacrifice more useful signal gains in the stream to this user, so that interference to another concurrently served user is reduced or minimized. This will lead to lower signal to noise ratios and hence lower MCS index being achieved at that user. On the other hand, in case of baseline, an access point has to serve only its associated user with single user MIMO service. Right? In that case, zero forcing does not have to sacrifice useful signal gains in, that, in the streams of the, to that user because it, it doesn't have to play nice with any other concurrently served user. Therefore, higher SNRs and hence higher MCS index may be achieved at that user. The inference from this exercise is that when a user is located close to an access point, then it might be better to use the baseline scenario to achieve very high MCS in this is that user. Otherwise, we might we should use DMIMO configuration to achieve better or higher MCS in this is than baseline. <coughs> this is what I meant by designing future networks as hybrids of both baseline and DMIMO configurations. That is, they should have the capability of switching between these two arrangements depending on how the users were distributed in the network space. That's, oh, there's one more result. Uh, this slide describes the spatial distribution of user throughput in case of baseline as well as DMIMO. Visibly, again, we can see that DMIMO is able to achieve a better distribution of user throughput compared to baseline, achieving improvements of up to 395% in, in an average user throughput. This is the case for millimeter wave wifi networks. All right. Are you, are you assuming an omnidirectional antenna? Yes. The, the bypass models are designed for omnidirectional antennas. Okay. I think for 60 gigahertz, it's. Uh, you can Unlikely that, that uh, the, the Wi-Fi or even terminals are using uh, you know, omnidirectional, antennas. omnidirectional few antennas. It's typically with uh, So we have two antennas right? per device, but the problem is most of the path loss models described in literature are for omnidirectional antennas. Like you have other cases which deal with based, like you know, ray tracing experiments, but they're highly specific to certain environments, which cannot be generalizable to other kinds of environments. I think to bring another level of realism to it might be a good idea to have some kind of beam forming going on within yeah. the uh, uh, beam forming on top of zero force simply building. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For, for the for the um, for the access point. Exactly. We we tried doing that, but the problem is the lack of availability of analytical path loss models, which describe path loss in case of um, in case of directional antennas. Mm -hmm. We have the path loss models only from direction antennas. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the presentation. The whole overarching objective of this dissertation was to study the use of distributed multi-user MIMO as a technique to improve the performance of networks, dense Wi-Fi networks, and uh, dense Wi-Fi network, uh, sorry, next generation Wi-Fi networks with dense access point deployments. 
we did that through four main sections. First, uh, we considered some challenges in realizing DMMO Wi-Fi networks, specifically the problems of channel access and multi-user memory user selection, and prescribed lightweight solutions to effectively address these challenges. We demonstrated improvements of up to 3.5 times and 191% in certain cases, which is great. Next, we implemented a DMMO Wi-Fi group using software-defined radio platforms in the indoor orbit test that has been lab. Uh, we used that implemented setup as a proof of concept of the proposed algorithms in section one and corroborated the results from section one. Uh, we addressed dynamic resource management challenges in our third section uh, using deep reinforcement learning techniques and we were able to demonstrate improvements of up to 20% uh, compared to existing heuristic solutions. Finally, we extended the architecture of DMIMO to dense Wi-Fi networks operating in linear megabit frequency bands. Um, initial simulation results revealed improvements of up to 395% in average user throughput performance with DMIMO. Uh, we also proposed a guideline to design future networks that can harness the benefits of both baseline as well as DMIMO configurations, depending on how the users were distributed in the network space. So this dissertation yielded the following publications and conferences, in journals. Okay, uh, okay. this section is, oh, well, uh, I intentionally did not practice this section because I wanted this to, be, to sound general. <coughs> uh, probably not a good idea in hindsight, <laughs> but, uh, okay, so this thesis is a collaborative effort. It's not just mine. A lot of people were involved in several capacities in, in the completion of this dissertation. First thanks, of, of course, goes to Professor Mandem uh, for being an amazing advisor. Uh, I know, I, I think this is like a cliche statement that everyone says in their defense saying, oh, I could not, couldn't have asked for a better advisor, but I really could not have asked for a better advisor. Uh, he was always available for me, um, even amidst his highly booked schedule as a chair of the department, uh, provided with amazing suggestions, constructive in case of technical content as well as uh, presentation. I hope to continue our collaborations further in the future as well. Uh, committee members, Professor Ray and Professor Sholin, uh, like, you were amazing mentors to me, even though I was not a student of yours. Uh, I was, you were always available whenever I had any questions, Professor Ray with his engineering insights, uh, and always bearing the practicality of the proposed solutions. And Professor Sholin and with her a very strong mathematical background, I still remember my first big internship experience came out of Professor Sholin and uh, referral <laughs> to Schlumberger in Cambridge. Um, Doc, uh, oh, it's weird to call you Dr. Tolkien, I'm just going to call you Eric. Uh, Eric, for always being there, uh, I had two amazing summer internships with Nokia Bell Labs, uh, within which uh, a majority of this work, not the no, general premise of the work, uh, took shape. Uh, thank you so much for being there, thank you so much for being an amazing mentor and uh, helping me along the way. And uh, yeah, uh, it was fun working with you. <laughs> then. Um, I would like to give a shout out to the collaborators, uh, Dr. Klaus Doppler from Nokia Bell Labs, Henker and Tala. Ivan's not here. Uh, I think Ivan plays an instrumental role in every single thesis that comes out of Bell Lab. Uh, I mean, I, I cannot, I, I'm not even going to try to describe the amount of help that he has done to me in various capacities, especially with orbit experiments. Uh, bringing in practical insights to my research. Uh, he's such an asset to Ben Lab, and I think everyone should make the best use of him. Uh, funding agencies, no one's here, so I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, all Ben Lab and EC staff members for taking care of administrative stuff for this and letting us focus on our research uh, single handedly. And friends and family. And friends like that. And I'm just going to, I don't have a thank you slide, I'm just going to leave the conclusions up and I'll stop there. Thank you. So, so do we have any other questions? Okay, I'm going to ask Roy's question again. Okay. Right here, well, here's what his, his sort of main issue was. Right? Okay. You have essentially a 100 millisecond network time that you're simulating. Right. And then your algorithm can figure out what the action is very quickly. Exactly. Whatever. Right. How much is it? A millisecond, whatever it is. M microsecond. Right? Microsecond. Right. But then to figure out the action, it takes about 50 seconds of performance analysis you have to do, right? Mm -hmm. no. Okay, I'll try no, to explain. Am I right or wrong about that? So each action, so the agent performs an action after each simulation. So all it needs is 100 milliseconds of network time. Right. We change the location of users or interferes and all that at the end of one episode, which consists of 50 actions. And each action consists of one second of simulation time. That is, okay. that is where the 50 seconds comes from. Well, the 50 seconds comes from essentially your... Having 50 actions per episode. 
So we could change that. We could have 10 actions per episode. We could have 100 actions per episode or whatever it may be. So what were you asking now? So, so, um, so then it takes how many episodes? Uh, around 800 episodes. But recall that that, that that was the worst case channel assignment. All the groups were assigned the same exact channel. In fact, have resulted in, a, in the dissertation where it started from a not so worst case scenario, in, in, wherein it took only 200 episodes to converge to the best assignment. So, so suppose um, uh, now, okay, so I'll ask the question a different way. Mm. You, you stop learning mm. and just said this is what the neural network is, this mm. is the, the model we're using, mm. and now you had that same cluster, that you know, physical kind of thing of these access points, and mm. these users are doing different snapshots, mm. right? Mm. You keep relocating them. Mm. Then you stay up at that high throughput. Mm. Is that right? Yes. So, uh, it, I mean, are, are we trying to, is this a practical scenario or a simulation scenario? Are we no, doing it? I guess it's in, in the way I've described it is simulation. Simulation. So, all it needs is one simulation. You, you stop learning, but yeah. you, you keep you keep repositioning the users yes. in this universe. Yeah. So right? all it needs is one simulation. What does that mean? All, uh, all so uh, because it, it already, the, I mean, the agent has already trained for, uh, and, uh, like, uh, for the previous amount of time, right? right? So all it needs to understand the f uh, effect of its action is just one simulation, one network simulation. So to you understand. do one simulation for one one hundred milliseconds. One hundred milliseconds, so and then you can make an assignment. Make an and make an action, and depending on that it, network state. What way is it still marry the? So essentially, you feel like oh, you've now built a good model. Exactly. Right. right. But but when does that model become a bad model? When you drastically like, change the network scenario. Yeah. So what does that mean? Like, so let's say um, I'll go back to this. Uh, simple channel assignment. Like, for instance, does the, the does the model like suppose you delete a few access points or you add a few access yeah, points? Yeah, you have to train from scratch again. And suppose you instead of you had some number of users like uh, Is it, 16, sixty-four users. Yeah. Sixty-four users. Yeah. Suppose you had thirty users or eighty users. So I, I, I'm talking about using an agent which trained to this particular network scenario, yeah. but then you're using it to a different yeah, network. So your scenario is like the, the access points are like this, and the users are sprinkled randomly in this box, right. 64 of them. Right. So the question is, when you get that model, mm -hmm. what is it? Is it useful? And so you're telling me it's, you, it's a good model each time you, you sprinkle the 64 users in this big box. Exactly. But right? if you change but the if user... if I sprinkle 80 users in this box, is the model worthless? You have to start over. Um, or, so, I mean, this is a bad example because when the channel assignment does not depend on the distribution of users. All it's trying to do is space out co-channel groups far uh, apart no, from each other. But somehow is the, is the 64 somehow encoded in a way that it's 64 No, because the input to the agent is only the group channel assignment is 16, and the output is the change of the channel assignment. So where yeah, this would... But somehow the groups are always are four, right? Exactly. Hey, that's true. That's uh, true. So you have to have some... If you somehow have 50 users or 70 users... Right. That, that's good, because in this example, we do have more number of users than the number of groups, right? In that information, we are encoding that information in the input to the agent in the form of our radio head user associations. So if that changes, the agent has to retrain. Suppose you encoded like you built the thing for ninety six users, mm. and you did all of your your training mm. with thirty two users with zero channels. Like they don't actually exist. They don't create interference. They don't actually receive any data. Mm -hmm. Now you train mm -hmm. where you keep moving around the people with zeros, but you train for ninety six, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And and then whatever number of users you have, mm -hmm. like seventy three, you create twenty six right. zero users, and and put that into the model. Would that work? And so, so I guess the point is, can we build a model which is highly generalizable, like instead of uh, Working just for this particular network scenario of yeah, a number of right. users. The question is how generalized. Right. It is kind of like now right. that you you know the terminology better than others. How yeah. generalizable is your model to uh, kind a, of hmm. just the sort of people come and go, the variations in what right. like happens, kind of on a. So we in our simulation scenarios, uh, in our training scenarios, we assumed fixed number of users. We did not study a case where we had variable number of users. 
But I'm sure we can formulate that as a reinforcement learning problem. I'm not sure how that would affect the, the learning performance of the agent, though. I'm guessing if you can use the same model which uh, trained for 96 users for 73 users, it should work. Not sure about the scaling up part. Scaling down should work. Scaling up, I'm not sure. Also, the number of users that we talked about here, I'm assuming it's a full buffer type of model. Yeah, it's full buffer. So they always have traffic. Exactly. Yeah. But in a bursting situation, the number of users can change very rapidly. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so uh, in our simulation scenarios, mm -hmm. all the traffic was full buffer. Like it was full buffer doubling <coughs> traffic. Okay, so I guess it has to do with the relative time scales of how rapidly the user's the user's configuration thing. changes yeah. versus the time scale of the, of the learning. Algorithm. Exactly. If, if, if the network is changing more rapidly right. than the learning <coughs> convergence right. time, then it can become unstable. Exactly. So the, the, the good part about my uh, or our reinforced learning agent is that it does not take a long time to converge, at least for the learning performance. The bottleneck here is the time it takes to simulate network performance or generate network performance results. So if we can expedite that process, then the training should take much slower, much slower, rather much shorter time. Yeah, I guess it would be nice if uh, you have uh, a series of scenario with different uh, user distribution, right? And it's the same agent, and the same agent would be able to handle it without actually adapting the model. That would be great. So, in fact, for each of these episodes, the distribution of users is different. It's just the only thing that's constant is the number of users. For each of the learning episode in the in that graph, the distribution of users is different because we model user mobility that, in that way. Right. So, for example, in this case, all of a sudden you give it the uh, uniform distribution of right. user. Right. Do you need to adapt the model? Or if the, the number of users work? is the same, it, it will work. It will. It, if the number of users is different, because then okay. you'll start changing the input dimensions of the neural network. Ah. Okay. That then is that is the number of users. Yeah. I have one comment. So your conclusion about millimeter wave, you have the highest gain there. It it's a time. bit counterintuitive because uh, you can easily get orthogonal transmission in the millimeter wave if I give every user a separate channel. Right, right. In mm -hmm. principle, there won't be any difference between baseline and smart. DMI mode, yeah. Right. Uh, so uh, is it because you have a very large bandwidth assumption for the baseline or it's also because of the fact that uh, baseline access point i mean the eirp requirements for millimeter wave is pretty high it's 43 dbm so zero forcing will have to sacrifice more useful signal power in case of dmimo to play nice with another concurrently served user so uh, if dmimo is doing 100 percent better uh, well so the, the the conclusion for us was that when a user is Located close to an access point, it might be better to use baseline. Yeah, that part is fine. Right. I think the overall conclusion that for millimeter wave, it's even more of a gain that when balanced by some other things you can do. Right, right. Uh, so orthogonal as and as you mentioned, the antenna is the other type. Exactly. So the biggest gain is the, the two point one gigahertz of bandwidth because that's such a large amount of bandwidth to work with. And also uh, the use of, um, so what works against baseline is the fact that each of these access points have now a very high AARP, so co-channel interference will be rather high. So it can go up to 43 dBm of AARP. And what DMIMO does good is it tries to optimally allocate power among these radio heads by distributing that 43 dBm. Ask an, uh, a question. Maybe it's uh, beyond uh, uh, the scope of what you're doing. Just on the hardware side, mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously you mentioned that it requires uh, synchronization. You know, extreme level of synchronization. Have you uh, looked at uh, you know the uh, uh, Wi-Fi uh, you know uh, Wi-Fi vendors out there? You know, other reasonable solutions to achieve that level of synchronization? That's, that's a good question. So uh, there's a group in MIT uh, from Dina Kata, uh, Professor Dina Katabi's group where they try to achieve synchronization among the radio heads over the air. So what they do is they assume one radio head to be the master and the others to be the slaves and the slaves synchronize with the master. I see. So the only concern for me there is I'm not sure how big the group can be because they consider the radio heads to be located close to each other. What if the radio heads are located very far apart from each other? So will the synchronization be lost? Because in our case, we had to achieve synchronizations of up to 10 nanosecond uh, you know, uh, difference between the radio heads. It had to be such tight levels of synchronization. So I'm not sure. Since we had a GPS system, it was able to do that or meet that. Mm. 
But in case of over the air, uh, I mean, they do have some really nice, interesting work in I think it's a company 18. But I'm, 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 I won't, I'm not completely sure about that. Okay, do you have any other questions? All right, thank you, Neil.